Carpenters Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. Jesus, lift your hands to him, the most high God. Give him the honor that is due to him as the most high. And that's to lift him high. To lift him high. Higher than anything. Higher above your situations. Higher above. Higher than those problems. Higher above those bills. Higher above marital problem. Higher above children problem. Higher above financial problem. Jesus, we lift you high. We proclaim boldly that you are Lord of Lords. King of all kings. Ruler. Lord of everything. We lift you high. We lift you higher than ourselves. For you are Lord and Master. We bless your name. Thank you, Father. Glory, wisdom, majesty, honor. Dominion to him who was and is to come. The Lord God Almighty, the Lamb upon the throne. Blessed be your name. We bless your name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen, church. Good morning. Good morning, church. How are you doing today? Why don't welcome the person by your side, your left side, hand side, your right hand side. Give them a smile. If nobody's by your side, turn back. Find somebody or two to greet. And give them a warm, loving smile that radiates agape and nothing else. Amen. Lest we find some trouble. Praise God. Are we ready for the word of God? Well, before I get into the word, we have some good news to share. Let me give some highlights. I'll give more after the word. Yesterday, we went to the, the Jubilee Prison Ministry of the Carpenters Church, the Carpenters Ministries, went to the Port Harcourt's Maximum Security Prisons for our annual medical outreach. And we thank God for the success of that outreach. A thousand and six inmates got born again. They accepted Jesus Christ. If you want to rejoice, it's not that pepe here clapping or rejoicing. 1,600. The Bible says there's much rejoicing in heaven over a soul that gets saved. But we have over a thousand. Is that how you rejoice over a thousand souls? Glory to God. Amen. A thousand and six got born again. 1,286 inmates received special medical care. These are the people that were attended to one-on-one. -on -one. They received medical care. Can we also give the Lord some praise about that? Amen. Amen. This is what the kingdom of God is about. This is what we are meant to be using our lives to do. And thank God we are doing that as God enables us and God will keep on increasing our coast and our border to his glory in Jesus' name. There are, more, there are more highlights which I'll give after the word. All right, turn with me your Bibles today to Exodus 36, beginning in verse 1. We'll read through to verse 7. Exodus 36 from verse 1. And Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan in whom the Lord has put wisdom and understanding to know how to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary shall do according to all that the Lord has commanded. Then Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work and they received from Moses all the offering that the children of Israel had bought for, brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary. So they continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. Then all the craftsmen who were doing all the work of the sanctuary came. Each from the work he was doing, 
And they spoke to Moses, saying, The people bring, too, bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to do. So Moses gave a commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from being, bringing, for the material they had was sufficient for all the work to be done, indeed too much. I want you to notice verse 5 with me and verse 7. In verse 5 it says, And they spake to Moses, saying, The people bring more than enough. Can you say after me, more than enough? And then notice verse 7. So the, for the material they had was sufficient, that's enough, for all the work to be done, indeed too much. Say too much. Notice those two phrases, much more than enough and indeed too much. I want to speak to us from this text on a message entitled, Attracting Much More Than Enough. Attracting Much More Than Enough. This is a message that was preached by God's general, Pastor Charles Omofoma, sometime, I believe it's 2002, I had the privilege of preaching it again in 2006, and today again, I'm honored to bring this word to us, and it is a now word for us. What God has been doing in recent times is to stir up messages that have been taught in years gone by. I mean, if, if you have in your message catalog thousands of messages recorded since around 98, literally thousands, well over 2,000 messages, uh, there's really nothing new in a sense that you're looking for to be taught that one way, shape, or fashion hasn't been dealt with. And this message was delivered then, and I believe that this word, we believe that this word is a word for us now. And we're talking about this because of the projects that are going on now, including the building of the auditorium. Remember our New Day vision. The first item on that New Day vision is what? Who reminds me? Number one, to get what? The auditorium roof up. So somebody says, well, why are we talking about, at the end of the day, it's money it comes to. You are correct. We are not hiding it. Why are we talking about money? Uh, why are we talking about this? Well, for one reason, we are talking about it because faith comes by hearing and hearing. Not a one-time hearing, but a continuous hearing of the word of God. Pa Kenneth Hagin was popularized for uh, teaching Mark 11, 22 to 24. He always had a message and, if he, I mean, and that was his message, Mark 11, 22 to 24. I believe he even preached that message more than Jesus Christ who even gave the word. Some people are so familiar with that text and, you know, assign it to Kenneth Hagin, forgetting that they are the words of Jesus. But he was often asked, pa, pa, why are you always teaching Mark 11, 22? Why are you always talking faith, faith, faith? And he would say, when you get this one, we'll go to the next one. And the fact that he spent a lot of time on it, apart from it being his call and his message, also showed the fact that they hadn't still gotten the message. So God wants us to keep on hearing it over and over again. And a, 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 a signature that you are getting the word of God is the fact that you'll be ready to receive it even again and again and again. Peter told the saints that uh, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, I will stir you up, stir up your pure minds along these lines Though you once know these things and you are established in the present truth. So you are established in the truth, but Peter, by the Spirit of God, still said that it was necessary for him to stir up their minds in a truth that they were established in. So even when you are established in this and you have mastered it, if you have really mastered it, when it's presented to you again, you won't say, there, there they go again. No, your heart will still be ready to receive it. So we're speaking about attracting much more than enough. And the much more than enough we are speaking about here, listen to me, church, is not much more than enough for you. Now, of course, you are involved because the money is coming, going to come through you, but it's much more than enough for the work of God. You know, it's a very good thing if offerings are being brought and the pastor and the minister says, bring no more offering. And the only time where we have this kind of much more than enough offering when people are restrained to give in the Old Testament was also during the, apart from this case, was also during the days of Hezekiah when a, uh, an offering was received because the Levites and the priests were not being given their offering. Hezekiah discovered it and he gave a commandment and people started bringing their tithes and offerings and Hezekiah went to 
inspect and saw a great heap of things. And he asked the priest, what is this? He said, uh, the priest said, as soon as the commandments came forth, the people have been bringing the, the tithes, the offerings, the portions of the priest. And what we have stashed and heaped up here is what remains. And would to God we get the day and get to that day. And I believe that day is coming in the body of Christ and particularly so in the Carpenters Church where we'll be restrained from giving because we are people of integrity and people will just keep on bringing and bringing and bringing and we will experience that where this auditorium is concerned. If you believe that, say amen. So what are we speaking about today attracting much more than enough? Three things we need to know. Number one, there must be a project in order to attract much more than enough. Again, not for you, but for the work of the ministry, for the work of God, there must be a project. A project is simply a scheme of something to be done, a proposal for an undertaking or an undertaking. A scheme of something to be done, a proposal for an undertaking, an undertaking. So what attracted much more than enough was the work, the project. God gave a project to the children of Israel through Moses, the building of the sanctuary. You actually find details of that in Exodus chapter 25, where God said, build me a sanctuary and that I may dwell among my people, Exodus 25. So there must be a project. Now the emphasis in our day is the project, the multifaceted project in the Carpenters Church, this local assembly. So we're saying there must be a project. Look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, And Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan in whom the Lord has put wisdom and understanding to know how to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary shall do according to all that the Lord has commanded. All that the Lord has commanded. So there is a project. But this project must be a God-given project. A God-given project. What the Lord has commanded. It's not just enough to have a project. The project must be God's project. What we are doing in the church, what we should be doing in, as a body of Christ, is what God has asked us to do. We shouldn't be running our own agenda. I want you to realize that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was not man's inception was not man's creation. It was the creation of God, of Jesus Christ himself, who gave himself for the church. And he said, I will build my church. It is my church. I will build it. So if we are doing anything in a local church, the body of Christ in general, and in the local church, we should find out what is the mind of God. What does God want us to do? And then we should do what God wants us to do. Even in your own life, you need to find out what does God want you to do. You know, growing up, you'd have said, I want to be an engineer. I want to be a, a doctor. I want to be an architect. I want, how many of you said all of that? I want to be a soldier. I want to be an Air Force. I, I said that when I was a child. I liked the uniform of the soldiers. But the Navy zone was, they, they looked, looked so impeccable. I said, no, I'll be a naval officer. And I hear they pay them more. The only one I didn't say I'll be is a policeman. <laughs> and I'm sure nobody here has said they'll be a policeman, you know? You know, so you, you say all of that, but as you grow up individually, and more importantly, as you grow up in God, you get to that point where you say, God, what do you want me to do with my life? Because he gave the life to you. It's the same thing in a local church. There must be a project given by God. And not only must the project uh, be given by God, the way and manner in which the project is to be executed must also be inspired by God. It must be given by God, the project, and the way and the manner, what you do about that project must be given by God. This sanctuary was God's idea, right? Right? It was given by God to Moses. But do you also notice that God himself, apart from giving Moses, the, 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 uh, telling him to build the sanctuary, the way and manner, the dimensions all the things about that sanctuary, do you know it was given to God also by Moses? So it's not enough to know what God wants you to do. You must also discover how he wants you to do it. Can I have an amen? In this church, we are building an auditorium. Who told us to build the auditorium? I want you to know it is God's idea. It was God's invention. It was not man's invention. 
But I want you to notice that apart from God giving that idea, seeding that thing into the heart of Pastor Charles, there, not only was the, the fact that we should build an auditorium in his heart, the way and the manner, the kind of auditorium to be built was also delivered unto him. That is why we are not building a 2,000-seater auditorium. Not that there's anything wrong with a 2,000-seater auditorium. That is why we are building the kind of building that we are building. Not because there's, it's wrong to build something that would have been a bit less, but for us, anything short of this would not do. Can I have an amen? Because that was what the Lord commanded to do. So there must be a project that God commands, and in your own life too, get what God commands and get from him the way that God wants you to do it. So what are examples of God giving projects? Well, I've mentioned building our auditorium. The auditorium project, however, is just a teeny weeny part of what God wants to do through us. I want you to notice that after we complete the auditorium, after we dedicate it, we are not going to breathe and say, Ah, thank God we are done building. I want you to know that. It's just a beginning. Because with God, it can only get... Yes, there are other things God wants us to embark upon. But that is an example of a God-given project. Another example of a God-given project is interesting. is fresh dew. Fresh dew is another project. Let me ask you a question. How many of you watch fresh dew? You watch fresh dew. Good, you watch fresh dew. Now... It would surprise you, it should surprise you, it should disturb you actually to find out that, for instance, last year, only 32% of the funding came from partners. Now, let me ask a, 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 a dumb question. Is the word on fresh dew? Is the word there? I mean, that's surplusage. We don't need to ask that. The word is there. How many of you listen to fresh dew? Raise your hands again. Keep it up. Don't do this. Lift it up. Good. Lift it up. Well, put your hands down. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, so I won't ask how many of you are partnering with Fresh Dew? How many of you are giving to Fresh Dew? Do you know that from the word of God, if a ministry feeds you, you are actually, a, God actually expects you to give back to that ministry. Not as a matter of a suggestion. The Bible says that let him, Galatians 6, 6, let him that is done what? Taught in the word what should he do? Communicate or share with him who teaches in all good things. That's partnership. In other words, if fresh dew has been a blessing to you, your life has been changed by fresh dew. You know, we meet young people. There are people in their 30s now, early 30s, who say they used to, I mean, in Benin, in Lagos, all around the country, in Port Harcourt, saying, I've, I've, I've been, I grew up as a young boy, young girl, listening to your messages, listening to Pastor Ketch on Fresh Dew. A lot of the things they know spiritually, some of them were in all kinds of churches, but they always remembered Cadbury breakfast. How many of you remember that? In the morning. And when you're about to watch, which one was, I think Fresh Dew was after? Cadbury breakfast, you watch it. And some parents, I even heard that some parents who would not even make their, who would not even watch it would insist that their children watch it. And everybody got to know that beautiful pastor. And they were listening. Some of them is the beauty that attracted them, but they still got the gospel. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what's my point? They've listened to that, they've grown, but they've not sent a cobble to fresh dew. It's not good. I said it's not good. There are a lot of us here listening. You receive the word from Fresh Dew. God expects you. Expect, because listen, at a, after a while, if you don't give to the ministry that is feeding you, do you know after a while it will actually stifle your own growth? It will. That's why Paul said, if we have fed you with spiritual things, is it anything if we reap your spiritual things also? Is that what he said? No, if we reap your what? Carnal things. So when a ministry feeds you spiritually, God expects you to feed back into that ministry with the material resources. Don't bring, don't bring, don't bring study books. I remember years ago, a brother gave me a notebook and a pen, you know, and he dropped a beautiful, a beautiful note on it. So what I took from that is that, Pastor, you have been preaching well, or maybe you have not been preaching well. Collect this notebook and pen. Begin to write. You don't, you don't do that to a minister. I know where I can buy a notebook. I know why I can buy Ben. If God has blessed you spiritually through a ministry, what does God expect you to do? To share back with that ministry in spiritual things. Another place you can 
project going on is Jubilee Prison Ministry. We just heard about it. Now, how many people did we say got saved? A thousand, over a thousand inmates accepted Jesus Christ. And over a thousand and two, close to a thousand three, got medically uh, attended to. I want you to notice that when we went to the Port Harcourt prison, we went with materials. And the budget for this outreach is in the neighborhood of six, was in the neighborhood of six million naira. Six million naira. That is not change, that is not kwekwe money. Six million bucks. Do you know what? Do you know we could have put that money in that auditorium? It would have received some flesh. But what is most important to God? What's most important to God? Souls. Even this auditorium we are building, what is it about? What is it about? Is it to show that, oh, we have a state-of-the-art auditorium? That's all part of it. People will be attracted to it. But what, at the end of the day, what will the auditorium say? It will point you to what God can do in a person's life. It will point to you to the excellence and the glory of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it will bring people to their knees to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That, at the end of the day, that is what it's all about. Can you say amen, church? So notice this. Write this down. When God commands a work, he brings the resources needed. When God commands a work to be done, he also brings the resources to be needed, uh, the resources needed. And what are these resources? Chiefly, material, human resources and material resources. Human resources, material resources. I want you to notice in our text, we find both of them. But in, let's look at the human resources. Who was the main human resource? Who was the main person where, where the building of the tabernacle in the Old Testament was concerned. Who was the main person? Who did God deliver it unto? Moses. Moses. By the same way, who is the custodian of what God is doing in this ministry? Our pastor. God raises a person. But I want you to notice that Moses also had people who were equally anointed to do that work. Who are they? Aholiab and Bezalel. Aholiab and Bezalel, those are the named persons. And then the Bible also talks about every gifted uh, uh, artisan, every gifted crafter. These were the people that God equally anointed to do the work. I want you to notice that this auditorium we are building, it is God's work. And because it is God's work, you must receive the blueprint, the download of all the information from the mind of God. We have a team of people who are supervising the work you know, the building team chairman, the project engineer, the architects, and all of these people. But not only are these people, not only must they be skilled in what they are doing, listen, church, they must be equally anointed to do the work. Because the only way you can do what God has asked you to do is by the enablement of his spirit and his grace. No wonder God says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my what? Spirit, says the Lord. They need the, the, the wisdom of God. And that's why, look at that verse we read, uh, Exodus 36 there. Look at verse, look at verse uh, 1. And Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan in whom the Lord had put what, please? Wisdom and understanding to know how to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary. So we see that they needed wisdom and understanding. Now, if you step into that auditorium, just enter through the foyer and just stand in the auditorium, you will agree with me that we need wisdom. And that's why we confess every Sunday, every Thursday, every Tuesday in our auditorium faith confession. One of the things we say, we have what? The wisdom of God and we know what to do. Our hands strengthened by his hands. Why is that so? Because if you enter that auditorium, it will intimidate you. It will, ah, it will intimidate you. Sometimes when we are praying and I'm just looking, I say, oh man, oh God, you, God, you are big in us. That is all I will say. That's why Pastor often says that after the auditorium, after the engineers and the builders do their work, Jesus himself comes at night in his own raincoat. And what does he do? He does what they have done. He retouches it, he supervises it, and he cleanses and he, he does his work. Because it is the Lord's work. 
You cannot do God's work with your own know-how. You need to receive a download of his wisdom to do it his way. Can I have an amen? And that's what happens when we make this confession. We have the wisdom of God. We know what to do. And human resources are very vital. You know that human resources are even more important than material resources. More than money. Why is that so? Because the money comes into the hands of who? The humans. Our hands. So when you actually pray for human resources, you're inevitably taking care of which resources? The material resources. In fact, in this story, remember, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt on the eve of their exodus, God gave them favor with, uh, to, uh, uh, with Egyptians, and they gave them material resources. So all these things that God said to bring, where did it come from? Did it drop down from heaven? No, it was in their hands. And when Pastor Charles was coming to Port Harcourt, many of us know the story. He said time to seek God's face and pray. And one of the, his main prayers, we know, was that God should give him people. And did God answer that prayer? I tell you, he did. He answered that prayer. And you are still part of the answer to that prayer. Can you say amen? So again, when God commands a work, he brings the resources needed. Look with me at Ephesians 4, 8 to 12. The saints are the ones to do the work of the ministry. We see in our text there, in the building of the sanctuary, it was the people who brought the materials needed for the service of the Lord's work. Today, the saints are the ones to do the work of the ministry. Ephesians 4, beginning verse 8. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who ascended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he may fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Notice that it's the saints who do the work of the ministry. Who are the saints? That's all of us, all of you. We are the ones to do the work of the ministry. Notice that it is not the ministry gifts who are necessarily doing the work of the ministry. They are doing the work of the ministry, but that's a giving. In this text here, it talk, talks about the saints being equipped to do the work of the ministry. What's the work of the ministry? Building the auditorium. That's part of the work of the ministry. What's the work of the ministry? Making fresh dew go on daily television. That's part of the work of the ministry. What's the work of the ministry? Building more homes for scarlet thread homes. I thought I'd hear an amen on that. What's the work of the ministry? Being able to go to more prisons. What's the work of the ministry? Being able to, to, to bring more comfort to the souls in prisons, like we did last year by buying hundreds of mattresses for the prisons at Degema and, uh, Degema and Ahoda. That's the work of the ministry. Who is to do the work of the ministry? The saints. All these things are called, there's a common denominator to them. What is it? Money. 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 Say, ah, is money important? Ah, say, ah. <laughs> Have you not spent money already today? Yes. Yes. How did you come to church? Renter goes, oh. Arrived church. Is that what happened? You entered moto. If you drove your moto, you used fuel. The fuel, uncle, how did you get the fuel? You know, when Christians become religious, they say things like, why are we talking about money? How you talk about, let us talk about love, the compassion of Jesus. Let us leave this money matter alone. Meanwhile, that is what is giving you sleepless nights. If the gospel doesn't have an address, doesn't address the problems of our lives, it's a powerless and impotent gospel, and we shouldn't want to have anything to do with it. Amen, church. But the gospel is the answer of God to all mankind's questions. It's the solution to all his problems. So don't get hypocritical. Why are we talking about money? We talk about money too much. Meanwhile, you are in basic. You and debt, debt is your middle name. In fact, it has replaced your first name. They don't, some people don't know you. Ah, that brother that is owing money. That sister that is owing money. That's why we talk about money. To liberate you. To remove those shackles from you so that you can bring money to the house of God. To further the cause of Jesus Christ. I love souls. I want to preach to them. 
but you don't have money to go and preach to them. What kind of message are you presenting? But the gospel will empower you. That's why it says for the maturing of the saints, the equipping of the saints. How does the gospel, how are you equipped? By the word of God. Like you come to church today. Remember God said uh, in Deuteronomy 8, 18, you will remember the Lord your God for it is he who does what? Gives you what? Power to do what? Get wealth. For what reason? To live in another house. That you may further his cause that he may confirm his covenant on the earth. That's why God wants to prosper you. So you make, there are some people, the story of many people here in church is that they came here 10, 15 years ago, broken, busted, disgusted. They were going nowhere and they were arriving there at neck-breaking speed. But they were apprehended by the word of God. And today, I know some of you, who, some of you who are so broke, you couldn't even buy anything. You're prospered. The challenge, though, is with some of us, we get to that place and all of a sudden, we start thinking of ourselves. No more the work of God. No more giving to the work of the kingdom. It's, not because, it's now us. The next house I want to build. The next car I want to drive. The next uh, vacation I want to... Those things are good and I believe they are the additions that God gives to us. But my question is this, why do you want another house? Why do you want another parcel of land? Why do you want to drive another car? If at the end of the day, there's nothing in that prosperity that doesn't, there's nothing in that prosperity that isn't emptied into the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's a problem with your desire. Didn't get many amens, so I came with my own amens, Pastor Shola, that was a good word. Move on, I will move on. So that's point number one. What's point number one again? What's point number one? There must be a project. Number two, the people gave or the people must give. So like we've seen, and I've already preempted this, in the building of the tabernacle, it was the people who brought the materials that were needed for the service of the Lord's house. Look at our text again, Exodus 36 verse 3. And they received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary, so they continued bringing to him free will offerings every morning. So we see here, first thing we want to observe is how did the people give? How they gave? Number one, they gave willingly. They gave willingly. Notice our text again. So they continued bringing to him free will offerings. Say free will offerings. Those two words, free will offerings, come from the Hebrew word, which refers to something given voluntarily. Voluntarily. That means it is given willingly. You are not coerced. You're not compelled. You're not forced. You're not cajoled. You can be told to give. You can be asked to give. But there must be willingness in your giving. In true giving, there is no sense of compulsion. Nobody forces you to give. Or nobody should force you to give. In fact, God told Moses, to tell the children of Israel to receive an offering from his, for his work from the children of Israel. But now notice what God said. He said, from everyone who is willing, you shall receive my offering. What does that tell you? You see, if God could radar the hearts of givers, there are some, if God were here in the flesh receiving our offerings, there are some people's offerings he will not receive. Anybody following me? Why do I say so? Because he said, for anyone who is of a willing heart, you will take my offering. So if you're not willing, does God want your offering? He doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. Do you know why? Because at the end of the day, the blessing on the giver is not just given to the giver. It rests upon the one who gives willingly, volitionally, not out of compulsion. So they gave willingly to his work. Write this down. God doesn't want to receive anything. I didn't say this in the first service. God doesn't want to receive anything from grumpy, god, grudgy givers. From grumpy or grudgy, they have asked us to give. All this one that this black pastor is talking to about now. At the end of the day, now money. It is money. Before uncle, it's money. But nobody will force you to give. You can be encouraged to give. But at the end of the day, it's your decision. And you have to have a willing heart towards the things of God. That is what will inspire you to do that. Number two, how did they give? They gave spontaneously. 
They gave spontaneously. Again, that word free will offerings, apart from it being voluntarily, referring to something given voluntarily or willingly, also speaks of something given spontaneously. Spontaneously. All right? When something is given spontaneously, what does that imply? It, it's something given ad lib, something that you didn't plan for. It wasn't in your budget. Now, there are two forms of giving that you should be involved in. Planned giving and spontaneous giving. Can you say after me, planned giving and spontaneous giving? That means you should plan your giving. And the principle that teaches us to plan our giving is what principle? What principle teaches us to plan our giving? Apart from budget, let's talk Bible. What principle? What principle? Tithing. Tithing. Because God asks for 10%, true? That is what he asked for. So when you receive that check, that money of 100,000, what do you plan with? What do you plan your, your life? or <laughs> What do you plan your spending with? The 100,000, what do you plan it with? At least, if you are only the person who tithes, at least what do you plan with? 90,000. If you are another pe if you are a person who gives another 10 percent, that's what I'm talking about. Planned giving. You see, apart from my tithe, I give another offering of another 10 percent. That's 20 percent upfront. And for some people, they give 20 percent as tithe, and then after that, they give another 10 percent, 15, 20 percent. Have you heard of the stories of people who gave who live, who gave 90 percent of what they earned and lived of 10? Have you heard of those kind of people before? I don't know about you. That is where I want to get to. Where I can live large, luxuriously, not comfortable. I mean, that what I want, I can have. But I can have it off the 10%. I want a new car. I can get it off the 10%. I'm not getting many amens because your face is, is mm, look at you. It will happen to me. I've been saying it and it will happen. When I was giving 10%, that was what I was saying. Now I give between 35, 40% upfront of what God blesses me with. It's in that range. So I'll keep on saying it. Before I know anything, it will be 50%. Before I know anything, it will be 70%. Doing what I am meant to do in my own life, but God prospering me. That can be your story. It's not just for Rockefeller or Ford. It is for you. And those people didn't start that way. They started giving a little. When you hear this message, don't say it is for that person. Don't rule yourself out. Why do you want the money you want? Why? If your reason is not to be a blessing, then it's your reasons are lopsided. Can you say amen? So we're talking about spontaneous giving. Plan your giving. I said plan your giving. But apart from that, be open to spontaneous givings. What do I mean? Think about, I mean, if you've gone through our premarital counseling in church, you must have learned about budgeting, right? And we say, bring this amount. Maybe you say for your house, depending on how you eat, your personal, individual capacity, estimated capacities of your household, you say 50,000 for food will cover it. Another 20,000 for utilities. And you, school fees, diesel, fuel, car, all of that, you budget. Why is a budget good? It's good so that it guards your expenditure. So some, your wife comes or your husband comes with a request. Uh, 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 my wife, my husband, let us help that person. What do you first make recourse to? Where do you first make recourse, recourse to? Budget. He enter budget. But if all your life, everything you spend for your wife, for your children, for your husband, your, the, every time you answer, they say anything, you say budget, then something do you small. No, no, something do you. We didn't budget for it. If all your life you live on budget, then there's something wrong. Why is that so? Because all, once in a while, you will be in the shopping mall, you went to shop for the family, and you just pass one place. Ah, this thing will be good for my wife. Oh. And you check it. How much is this? And they give you the, the amount. Oh, man, no be small pepper. But you say, okay, I know she will like that. I want to make her day. I want to make her smile. You know, she's, more, she's a wife more, 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 more than rubies. Yeah, somebody's saying, yeah. <laughs> so what do you do? You buy it. And you just come home and you say, my babe, wife, whatever you call her, and you give it to her. You say, oh, why did you buy it? No, you are just on my heart. You are just on my mind. I just said to give this to you. 
It's not my birthday. It's not her. Where did you get the money from? Uh, uh, leave that alone. That's spontaneous. Or it was her birthday and you spoiled her and you did all of that and then you traveled out of the country on a course or something and you had some money on you. Will you say, a week ago was my wife's birthday. I've already spoiled her. That, was even, that one too was not on the budget because we didn't budget her birthday. <laughs> but you are there. Even if it is, uh, what they do, the, what's this thing in the airport? Free zone. Sorry? Duty free. Good. So they say, oh, they, they say, oh, the price is meant to be less. Whether it is really less or not, okay. You say, you buy perfume. You buy something. What are you doing? You're being spontaneous. And God help you if you have the kind of wife that when you pick up at the airport, she asks you, what did you bring for me? Or starts zip, unzipping your, not from the car, but as, the, as, soon as, the, uh, uh, as soon as your bag enters the room, the wife opens, I don't know that kind of person, but opens, opens the box and begins to inspect, what did you bring for me? What do you bring for me? God help you. You may not sleep in that house that night. <laughs> I don't know those, that kind of person. There is nobody, there is no wife in this place like that. But what's my point? Spontaneity. Or you're bringing your children from school. Daddy, can we have ice cream? No, you only take ice cream in Christmas. Ah. Ah, wala wa. <laughs> oh, daddy, now we are just at spa. We are, daddy, please, daddy, please. No. You have to be disciplined in your life, Mr. Discipline. <laughs> Discipline, call. What's my point? Spontaneity spruces and spices your life. On the spot of the moment. And it's meant to be the same when you're giving. I've given towards the budget. I've given towards this. I've given pastor this month. But sometimes your heart just tells you the Lord moves upon your heart. And you say, you know what? I'm going to give this thing again. I didn't plan for it. And I have found out that many times it's those spontaneous on the spot things that carry the extraordinary blessing of God. Because many times, the process of watering the other seeds you have been sowing consistently and faithfully. God says, son, it's time for a whammy harvest. Just release that thing. And you are struggling with God. Release what you have in your hand. And God will release what he has in his hands for you. Can I have an amen, church? Spontaneous. How else did they give? They gave continuously. They gave continuously. Notice in that verse again, it says, so they continued bringing to him uh, uh, free will offerings. They continued every morning. Somebody says, ah, Pastor Shola, you are stretching this one. It is Israel that continued to bring. It is not one person who gave that continued to give. I believe that not everybody may have given more than once, but I believe a good number of them gave. Do you know why? Because of the use of that word spontaneous. It seems to say to me that they gave and if you were, you were a giver, you'd have experienced that before. Sometimes you've given for something, and God still moves on your heart. Add that one. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Add that, put that one in, put that. It's not just that one. In fact, sometimes, Pastor has shared with me sometimes, you know, when God moves upon her heart to bless somebody, she just thinks it is this, and then it starts. You buy this one, and she knows God is not done. Just keeps on adding, adding, adding. That's spontaneity. So it's not just that they gave once. They kept on giving over and over every morning. The Bible says concerning the uh, Philippians, Paul speaking to them, he said, for when I was at Thessalonica, you sent once and again to my necessity. They gave three times. No other church did that. So your giving is meant to be continuous. Continuous. Can you say Amen. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, let us, uh, uh, how does he say it again? Him that is taught in the word should share with him that teaches in all things. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. He that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting, life, life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we will reap if if it's conditional, is it guaranteed? No, we will reap if we do not faint. Faint in what? In giving. Not being weary in what? Well-doing. What is the well-doing in that context? Giving. So you do not give and you say, Lord, I gave in January 2010. Look at you. I gave one million naira. We no go hear what? First, we don't they give to 2000 since January 10. You don't pass you. 
Lord, until that harvest comes, I'm not giving anything. You're your own. Harvest, no, they come. Because due season, harvest comes at due season. And due season only comes if we do not do what? Faint not. So giving as a child of God is not a one-time thing. It's a lifestyle. Um, I, my prayer is that if you are not a giver as a lifestyle, make that your decision. See, don't let the blessings of this new day pass you by. Are you following me, church? It will not pass you by. I said it will not pass you by. But as you're saying amen to that, also decide that you are going to do what God expects of you to do in this new day, to make this new day blessing and prophecy, flesh and reality in your life. Can you say amen? Finally, they also gave continuously. So how did we see they, say they gave? They gave what? Willingly, spontaneously, continuously, and generously. Write this down. Everyone gave. Everyone did what? Everyone gave. Everybody gave. As soon as the commandment came, they all gave. Now, they did not all give the same amount. That is sure. If you go to Exodus 35, you'll find out that everybody gave. Women gave. Men gave. Rulers of the people gave. They all gave as God prospered them. Can I have an amen, church? They all gave. You see, I like that part pastor added into the auditorium faith confession. When was that again? I think like November. When we normally say, uh, uh, I think I even wrote it down in my notes. Let me see if I have it. What did we used to say? Uh, this is the time for an unprecedented flow of wealth and riches for this auditorium project. And before, water flows from rocks. Wealth flows from nations. So, Lord, let the nations be bringing. Iwanko, Yunko. Wealth flows from nations. The heavens are open wide. So, yes, wealth is coming from them. What of you? That's why that next, that new thing she, add, uh, she added, uh, uh, this, is the ne- this is the time for, uh, I'm coming, I'll cool down now. Uh, uh, this is the time for an unprecedented flow of wealth and riches for this auditorium project. I release my precious. And as I give, it is given to me again. And I, ah, ah, oh Lord. I yet to do what? Ah, uh-huh, I give again. Don't be quiet during that part. And if you're a man or a woman of your word, if you don't like that part, don't make it. Because you are meant to be acting on it. It's not for the other. You see, when people hear messages on giving, they hear it for the next person. Or they look at, is that brother? She's very, he's very rich. Ah, he's barrister. He's very rich. They are the people giving. Oh, people like us will not give. No. Why do you want to give yourself a reason for not being, for not being part of what God is doing in the now? It's you. Everybody gave. They didn't give the same thing, but everybody gave. So if you've been giving 10,000 naira, when you started giving towards the auditorium, I can tell you, you will not remain at 10,000 naira. Can I have an amen? Why? Because the harvest will come, and with every harvest that comes, you are empowered to give yet again. And this is the speed that God wants to do in this season. This is the sea speed that God is bringing this season. He will empower us, but he will only empower those, listen, who know the purpose for the harvest. If when your harvest comes, it is all about you, it is all about you, it is all about you, it is wrong. There's something fundamentally not right about that. Amen. Look at that text, Exodus 35, verse 21 and 29. Then everyone whose heart was stirred, and everyone whose spirit was willing, sorry, then everyone came whose heart was stirred, everyone whose spirit was willing, and they brought the Lord's offering, verse 29. The children of Israel brought a free will offering to the Lord. All the men and women, look at this, whose hearts were willing to do, sorry, to bring the material for all kinds of work. So you see that everybody gave. But now notice the particular people that also gave. Whose hearts were what? Whose hearts were what? Willing and whose hearts were stead. Now I know that at the end of the day, it is God who moves upon you. It is God who moves upon your heart, stirs you to give. 
But listen, the language here, I believe, predominantly points to the fact that you make yourself willing. If you walk with God, it's not every time God tells you to give. In fact, most of your giving shouldn't be that, God, I'm waiting for you to give. No. You move to begin to give, and God will, as you are going, that is the way God leads. You don't say, Lord, I'm waiting. Baba, sorrow, speak. What should I give? You not hear anything then. Or you know what you do? You give very tashere. Say tashere. Say tashere. What is tashere? Small. You just give small. Say, okay, God. The more generous your heart is, the more generous your giving will be. Let us give towards uh, the, the, oh, Pastor Ian came, he preached. Let us give him a good offering. Some will never, the thought of giving him 100,000, 50,000 will not cross somebody's mind. So why should you give him that? What you begin to think is, ah, if I give him 50 and everybody gives him 50, he'll be richer than all of us. That is a poor man's mindset. Amen, church. Should we talk these things the way they are? Yes. Say, so, no, I beg. I'll give him 3,000 naira. For somebody who labored in the world, so you look at him like that. If you are the only person who was going to bless him, forget other people's giving. If you are the only person who was going to bless him, how much would you give him? There's something pastor says, you can't put a price on the anointing. You can't pay, who, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think you can pay a man of God? As a man who labors in the world, like the Bible says. Uh-uh. But you see, your heart, you must become large, you must become, what's that word? Liberal, large-hearted in your heart. And that's the way you'll be able to give. So when you give a million, you say, well, I've not given, I've, I've given too much. No, God can still move your heart and you can make yourself willing and give more. Can I have a good amen? And finally, number three, the people who are passionate promoters. Number one, there must be a project. Number two, the people gave or the people must give. And number three, the people who are passionate promoters or we can say the people should be pas passionate promoters. Look at our text again. Exodus 36, 5 and 6, and they spoke to Moses saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to do. So Moses made it, gave a commandment and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp saying, let neither man or woman do any work for the offering of the sanctuary and the people were restrained from giving. So the people kept giving till they were restrained from giving because they were passionate promoters. Write this down. A promoter is one who carries out an effort to publicize and increase the sales of a particular product. One who publicizes, who carries out an effort to publicize and increase the sales of a particular product. One who furthers the progress of something. One who furthers the progress of something. One who raises something to a higher grade. That is, one who carries out an effort to publicize and increase the sales of a particular product. One who furthers the progress of something, one who raises, raises excuse me, something to a higher grade. And to be passionate, of course, means to have an enthusiastic interest or desire. So we're talking about a passionate promoter and a product. What is the product we are involved in today? What is the product? It's the gospel. Say the gospel. Say the gospel. What is the gospel? According to Romans 1.16, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. If your life has been changed by the gospel, if you can say that you are who you are because of the gospel, can I see your hand up? Can I see your hand up? Everybody should. Well, you should be the person to promote the gospel. Why is that so? The person who has derived benefits from a product is the person who is in the best position to persuade people to buy into that product? I know of forever living products. I'm not making, holding brief for them. Or, so I'm just saying it because it's what readily comes to mind. And I know they, they have these products, you know, that they sell. And they are quite expensive as far as I'm concerned. As far as everybody, as far as everybody is concerned. But before you sell that product, you must use it. Who knows what I'm talking about? You must use it. You can't tell somebody this cream will make your skin, skin like baby skin. Meanwhile, your skin is like Arubo skin. That it, it has cracks and <laughs> layers and, you know, 
I want you to buy this cream. No, no. But when you go, sekwe, sekwe, and show the cream, your, 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 your skin is shining, glowing, to the glory of the skin, not to the glory of God. Though. And you say, take a look at me. Wow. Ah, what happened to you? You've changed, though. I've changed, though. It is this. How much is it? Oh, man. Oh, man, 20 kill. Mm. But they'll still buy it, though. What has that person done? They've convinced you into a product. Why? Because they've seen that your life has been changed by it. If your life has been changed by the gospel, you need to be a passionate promoter and promote the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you promote the gospel? By putting your money there. Not just your mouth. Put your money where your mouth is. Look with me at 1 Samuel 30. Let me end with this. Write this down. Giving is the expression of passionate promoters. Giving is the expression of a passionate promoter. And not everybody is required to leave all they are doing and go, to go into full-time ministry. But all of us are called to passionately promote the gospel. 1 Samuel 30, 23. But David said, my brethren, shall, my brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given to us. Who has preserved us and delivered us out of the, hand, of the troop that came against us? For who will heed you in this matter? But as his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who does what? Stays by the supplies. They shall share alike. So whether the pastor who is called to full-time ministry, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, doing the work of the ministry in terms of preaching the gospel, a missionary, or you who bring your money to fund the gospel, what are we doing? We're involved in the same product, the gospel, and God says we shall share how alike. Heaven will not reward the preacher more than he rewards you for funding the cause of Christ. We share alike in the labors. Uh, we may have different labors, but because we put our money to the same cause, we share alike in the same results. Can you say amen? How many of you remember the story of David and his three mighty men? When David was very thirsty and he longed for a drink at the well of Bethlehem and he just uttered it. He said, who would give me uh, uh, a glass of uh, water from the well of Bethlehem? And his three mighty men broke through the enemy ranks, went in to get a glass, a cup, or at most a pail of water. They risked their lives, like David said. They hazarded their lives. They went, they went through thick and thin, through enemy, enemy lines, not for something major, just for a wish that David said. David, David could have commanded his men to do it. Go and get me water from the well of Bethlehem. The best they would do is grumble. Now, which kind of God be this? It's no serious, no serious fight today. But he didn't do that. He just, oh, maybe he remembered his youthful days. There's something about that water of Bethlehem. It couldn't have been sweet because they say water must not have taste. But there must have been something about that water. Ah, can I just have some water? And the three men looked at themselves. And they broke in through. Killed. Killed. Ah, oh, maybe got a scratch. And they came. And David said, what? You brought this water to me? What were those, David, what were those three mighty men of David? They were passionate promoters. They risked their lives. That was a natural king. The person whose cause we are promoting is who? The king of kings and the lord of lords. And there is nothing that is too much to give in this new day that God is doing new things in the Carpenters Church and in the ministry. My prayer is that your heart is stirred by this word and the response to this word will be positive and robust and together we will do what God has called us to do in these days. Remembering that there is a project and that we are all to be givers and as we are givers, we'll be passionate promoters of the cause of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you say amen today? Did you learn something this morning? Lift your hands, thank him for his word. Blessed be his name. The Lord's name is praised. The Lord's name is praised. We bless you, Father. We give you praise, glory, honor. Thank you. We bless your name. Thank you for your word. And we are doers of your word. And we are profited by your word. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around this moment. All heads are bowed, please.